So welcome to another episode of The Shredder Show. And today I've got the pleasure of having great friend uh, Ryan Crowley on the podcast and the video for YouTube. Um, so Ryan, I've known for a few years. He is a bit of a mutant for being ginormous for his age, which I believe you're now 24. He may well correct me this. Um, but Ryan is an incredible oh, physique. Uh, you, you 24? Yeah, I'm 24 now. I'm 25 next year. I'm really you're, old. You're, you're practically old, Ryan. So um, Ryan's got a plethora of experience competing and also traveling around the world. And then we also spent some time together uh, in Dubai earlier in the year, which went um, in a slightly different tangent than I was probably expecting. Um, and initially, Ryan, do you want to give... Uh, some perspective maybe on like how you first came into body bodybuilding maybe and like how you in like where you got to before you were at in Dubai yeah of course sorry about my voice um it's not come back properly but so yeah I started bodybuilding when I was 15 years old um accidentally not not deliberately by myself it wasn't something I chose to do but uh I, I was fat as a kid you know wanted to better myself and I was working as a mechanic and next door to the the garage was a bodybuilding gym. And I remember seeing people go in, in and out like big guys in hoodies. And I was like, oh, they look cool. And uh, yeah, I just one day I managed to like, oh, okay, I'm going to go in there. I'm going to go see what's happening. So I went inside and I said to the guy, I said, um, can, can you help me? And he said, yeah, of course, I'll help you, but uh, you, you have to do that. And I said, what's that? There was a poster on the wall of a bodybuilding show. It was like seven seven months in advance. I said, I don't even know what bodybuilding is, man. He said, okay, well, if you want my help, let's do it. We're doing that. I said, okay. So that was it. He helped me to do my diet, my posing every day trained me everything and uh, that was where it started to be honest but yeah so since then I've done 22 or 23 shows now I actually have 19 trophies or medals here in the house but they're pretty well uh, I've been one point off my pro card maybe five times now won my class a lot just never won the overall to get my pro card um, competed in Vietnam Portugal Italy, loads of different countries, and uh, everything was going good on the rise. I went to America, started meeting all the right people, and then I went to Dubai and changed everything. <laughs> so, so that will come to. Um, so, firstly, obviously, Ryan has got a huge amount of experience from a very young age, and um, really like risen obviously very quickly through everything. And then, uh, how come you ended up in Dubai in the first place? Well, because I'm trying to, I'm trying to go to America, and right? it's I came back to the UK to see my parents for Christmas. And at the time, because of COVID, you couldn't fly America to UK. So I thought I'll go to Dubai a couple of weeks, then you can fly to America. However, two weeks turned into nine months, and so it was a bit longer than I intended to. Because obviously, I've been there maybe two, three, four, five weeks, and we're we were enjoying it, you know, I'll stay a bit longer. And then I got injured. Okay. So, um, and for anyone who doesn't know about that, that came don't about. Think anyone doesn't know me. <laughs> so this is, this is, this is where the conversation is going to get interesting. So, um, when obviously you, myself and Larry wheels had arranged to train and we decided to go obviously do the, like, um, yeah. Uh, your fault, Charlie. Like, I actually do. I did actually, and I still do feel incredibly guilty about it. To be fair, um, no, you shouldn't. It's but really it's uh, really one of those things in terms of how, like, what they call the butterfly effect. How like other people's decisions can change other people's courses of other people's lives. And I remember saying to you at the time, which we'll come on to, like how you can spin this into a positive in a lot of respects. But how do you think that day changed your life or that moment almost? Well, I mean, for one. I've never been in so much pain instantly and for a long time. Two, obviously before that, maybe for seven, seven years, been working towards something that kind of even then, well, that mainly then was 
in my eyes over. Still, now a little bit, I still think I probably won't ever be as good bodybuilder as I could have been before the injury. Um, obviously, a lot of attention, social media, etc., has changed too, which is great, and I'm very appreciative of it, and it's amazing. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't want that for the injury. You know, a lot of people are like, "Oh, yeah, you do your pack delivery, mate." I said, "No way, man! Like, I would definitely have, I would, if I had the choice, I would be banging that rewind button." Yeah. You know? And that's uh, an interesting one. How, what was your, do you think, that, for anyone who doesn't know, what was, what was the scientific term of what happened with your injury, Brian? Uh, the pectoralis rupture major. So obviously most people get uh, a tear of the muscle belly or maybe tear the tendon off the bone. This thing just completely exploded. The whole pec, like say it's a muscle exploded like this, the tendon just disintegrated, everything was in pieces, so they had to fix it all, you know. And if for anyone who hasn't, if you head over to my YouTube or Larry Wilson's YouTube, you can sort of see what happened. But in regards to the surgeon and how he obviously managed to fix and repair that, um, he obviously has done a pretty good job, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I think. Again, it was supposed to take one hour, took six hours. Everyone else in the surgery room with him told him that it was impossible. And I, before I went in, I said, mate, don't leave that room until it's done. So he let, when he left the room, it was done. I mean, it's just, he's done a great job, yeah. Now, I've been training it and using it as much as possible well no, no, not as much as possible as much as my my brain allows me to because i'm just so scared man like i'm just really scared to use it and i'm um, oh, sorry you continue yeah i'm just really scared to use it and it really messes me up in my head you know like nearly now i can train everything else and i'm getting back into a groove a little bit but every time like okay let's do some chest it just it's just fuck it just kills me man and it just puts me off and i don't want to train i get embarrassed and then i just just want to leave the gym but i have been doing a lot i was doing lots of rehab in dubai um i haven't been doing as much rehab here because i haven't really found a, a guy local to me the guy i've been speaking to is five hours north um, so yeah but it's, apart from the fact that we're actually just messing up my chest training I thought I was Superman I'm no longer Superman anymore you know I thought I was indestructible and now I just feel so vulnerable um, because before I used to think okay I'll get a hack squat I'm going to move it as many many times as I can until I can't and that's it you know with anything to be honest but I didn't think you would actually break, but now obviously I know you do. I just kind of can't seem to get that out of my head. Do you think that this happening has almost changed your identity of the way you think about yourself in some respects? Um, uh, I, not really. The only thing that it does change is obviously everyone and their dog knows me for the injury which is a bit I find it a bit sad you know because in my head it makes me feel like I haven't done anything else and I felt like I was doing really well at bodybuilding you know like in in bodybuilding like all the top pros everyone that we look up to all know my name you know I'm good friends with them they were all like proud of me how I was doing progressing every year and obviously now everything has just gone to the injury. It's kind of, it's feel like everything I've, I've really worked hard for has kind of gone to the sideline. So it's a bit sad, you know, especially at the Arnold, man. The Arnold here in the UK, like I went there, it was amazing. There was so many people who stopped me. It was cues, the pictures and to sign things. And I was like, wow, this is crazy. But like, 
it's just sad because 98 percent of people are like oh how's a peck you know the odd person's like man i was following you before you know but uh yeah it's just i guess it's, it is what it is right how it's, it's it's a sorry state of affairs but i imagine you're sick of answering questions about it no i mean it's a very it's very beneficial to some people you know even if they haven't got a injury or something maybe they're going through something they're struggling too and i benefited and motivated and a lot of people around the world with it um some way or another which i am uh, really appreciative and grateful to be able to do because it's obviously a, if it hadn't happened it's a special way you can touch people emotionally that are going through something similar so i'm always very open on social media I always have been but Obviously, now people have seen this part of it too. A lot more people reach out to me in terms of like emotionally, you know. But I think that's where a lot of value, I think that's where a lot of people being dear to you because it shows uh, vulnerability because people might look up to someone like you on social media and think that you have everything and everything's perfect. And when something doesn't go quite the way it's supposed to or something goes wrong, that's when you really see like the testament of people and how they manage those situations. And I think... Um, the way you've managed everything, I think, is remarkable. And actually, one thing I, I was um, highly impressed with is the amount of muscle mass you didn't lose. Like, how much? How much did your I weight? Lost just... a lot. But, uh, I but... actually lost a lot, man. I went. I was three hundred and thirty-eight, I think, on the day when I was with you, and then um, I got down to a point about two eighty-seven, which was the worst. But now I'm about 304, but I'm still 15 kilos down, isn't it? I still, still feel very small, man. Um, it's this weird one because I don't know how much of it is actually muscle and how much of it is just glycogen from the sheer, like the way I used to train. Because, you know, I used to train, train for hours. Yeah, I, was always, I was always pumped. I was always, I was always eating loads of carbs. You know, I just don't, I'm not the same person right now because I go in there with like, I'm very strict on most things that are legs, to be honest. Well, I'm even strict on that because I'm scared too. So I just, I just don't get the same, like, walk, come out of gym feeling jacked anymore because everything's so focused and in one plane of motion, you know, everything's so slow. There's no like actual, ah, let's just kill it. You know, I just I don't get that same feeling anymore. And I feel like that's one, not allowing me to eat enough to put the weight back up and two, I'm not getting the same pump, but um, I am. I have been for a week now, just dieting a little bit because I want more of a short-term goal. Um, because it's kind of not. I was eating really badly, and well, I wasn't getting fat, but I was just getting a bit more out of shape than I like to. And you know, what's the short-term goal then? I just want to. Well. Obviously now, man, you know, as you know, is everything right now is just social media for me. You know, one of my short-term goals is to grow as much as possible. Um, two, obviously with that, if you look at the top performers on social media, they like strategy around. So obviously the leaner I get, the better it is for social media. So I thought, that's one goal. And two, I do want to compete at some point, um, but I'm just... The pet looks so bad, man. Like it really does. I, I, I see that front relaxed pose. You know that first pose when you come out just looks so bad. Look, I'll show you on here. I think um, it's one of those things. That I think it's not. I think in your head it's worse than you th think it is. Whereas I think in reality, if most people didn't know what happened, they probably wouldn't clock clock it. Do you know what I mean? But it's because oh, of, man, it does. It does look really really bad you can see it's more just like scarring on it to be honest with you and slightly well, the problem is right now can't use my pec well to the, to the standard that it would fill up with blood and glycogen to get pumped to the same with the front delt so therefore they're not like actually expanding much and then the actual thing that looks the worst is the fake tendon the tendon is like really sharp, there's a little sh sharp line of it here. Um, and that, that's what looks the worst. 
you know, I can't really like cover up the line. And the leaner I get, the worse it's going to look. Um, so the fake tendon they actually put in, what's that made of? Just some bio stuff material. What happened is they, they sew your pec together and then they like take some muscle fibers, uh, like twindle them in with some bio stuff and drill it into my humerus. And then they wrap it with metal cord. It was like a backup. But that was what I was having problems with. You know, I was having those cysts yeah. that actually pulled that metal cord out. Well, half of it. Um, and now I've taken it out, it's been okay. Like, I don't have any problems with that anymore. See, it's looking much better, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but, yeah. What, what would you say to anyone else who's going through a similar sort of thing in terms of an injury like this? Sorry, my, my throat's just very bad. I know I sound very like horsey. Sorry. There's a lot of things to it. You know, there's a lot of people ask how I stay motivated, how do I keep doing what I do? But I think ultimately the thing is, I, I, I've done everything I can pretty much since the injury, like I was before. I didn't want the injury to just change my life for the worst completely you know I went for a period of being in hospital and everything and still can't train the spec but I wanted to resume what I was doing as, as quick as I could in terms of training the rest of my body um, and like I just want to be successful in, in life you know and I was always bodybuilding was the 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 path to it and it's just Every day you just got to keep putting one foot in front of the other and just, I try not to think about it too much, you know, because if I think about it too much, that's when I get really sad and I'm, and uh, it gets me down. It's just so, there's so many people that believe in me as well. I just can't give up on that, you know. I think it's, it's just, it, it is what it is, you know. It happened for a reason. I don't know what the reason is. Maybe one day I'll find out. But uh, obviously in terms of bodybuilding, no really anyone was coming up in bodybuilding, had an injury, gone down and come back up again. It was always, they were at the top of bodybuilding. So <clears throat> I do want to be able to still make it to the top if I can, because that would be pretty cool, you know, be like, I remember that guy when he was 20, he had a major injury and now, you know, that's kind of why I hope to do. Um, but we will see because you have to be very careful with this sort of thing. I think it's one of those things that it just, again, like, I personally believe in you and believe you can do it, if that's any credit to you. And I also think that you. you have the right work ethic and attitude to do that. But I think, again, it's just the key of like how, how, how much you want it and having the right information and the knowledge around you. But how insane would that be to get to that level like whilst going through those challenges? And also, that would make you the only person to do that, which, again, which would be even more impressive. Yeah, I know. That's kind of one of the things that keeps driving me too. And it's just, as you know, what the smallest decision can have the biggest impact on your life. So every time I'm in the gym, I'm like, okay, right, let's push it, let's push it, you know? I'm like, oh, the smallest decision, right, remember what happened? And they, ah, oh, okay, don't, don't worry, let's leave it. But then I'm like, if I don't push through this, man, it's not going to get better. And like, so everyone's like, oh, was it too heavy? We should have done this and like that. Like, give it, man, I'm a bodybuilder. Every time I go to the gym, something's too heavy. But if I don't do that, I wouldn't have been 300 pounds of muscle. So it's this mindset you have trying to be the best at anything, you know, like business, bodybuilding, crypto, or whatever you want to do. You've always got this line. You're like, okay, I'm going to go over it a little bit today. I'm going to go over it a little bit today. Just to try to get to the next level. And then you're like, oh, shit, I went too much. It was driving a car, right? Oh man, we'll do this corner really fast, you know. It's gonna be fun. Oh shit, bang! Oh, I was a little bit too fast, you know. It's just I hate when people are like, "Oh, you're lifting on this." All right, maybe I was a bit more jacked up because you and Larry were there, and you know it was getting filmed and stuff. But it is what it is. I just what well, I never thought it was gonna be me, and it was me. So, have you have you heard of uh, like the story Icarus who like flies too close to the sun? So I think it's like Greek mythology, and then gets burnt. That's basically the way I try and think a lot of the time. It's just like, you almost like, you know, you're talking about going over the lines, like you want to just like dip your toe over, but like yeah. it, 
it's so easy to go too full on with with anything and then once yeah. you've gone too far you can't it's difficult to then come back um so that, that was a really good analogy to try and explain that to be fair do you think back to that moment a lot because I, I i was thinking about it a lot because i remember i remember when it happened you first tried to unrack the weight and then struggled and then put it back and then yeah and i remember saying to you just just do 200 just do four and a half plates and like and that that's still shit if i'm honest man i still think 200 would have done the same thing i think ultimately the, the science behind it is because my left shoulder is is was very pain it's very has been long-term painful i think i always try to do more with my right arm therefore this arm was taking so much more weight and the tendon just couldn't hold like the more people i speak to that's what they think happened you know because this shoulder is very painful still now and i haven't been training man um, i've had loads of injections in it too um i think realistically i need surgery on this but uh, i won't be doing that <laughs> what do you think the left shoulder injury was from just uh wear and tear yes as i can remember i can't remember any major injury i think i think just shoulder pressing maybe too much weight you know as you know i always like to train heavy and always have since i was young i think when you start packing on so much muscle everything moves the tendons move you know you're putting through so much stress and maybe you if you're so pumped and then you're like unpumped i don't know i think it's just messed up the bicep tendon in here and it's pulled it out of its groove and then they've actually got is it tendinopathy i think and a slap tendon tear i think yeah that's what it is but you know, I, I, I don't obviously the weight was too much but i just don't like talking about it like that because i could say that about anything you know even if you didn't have a major injury but say you were doing the leg extensions one time and oh my knee hurts and then for the rest of your life your knee hurts there's no injury but you just you know something happens to your knee and it hurts you're like Shh. you know it's you don't want to think about it you're like, oh, i was just trying to just trying to do, do my best man yeah i think it's one of those things i think um what was in, uh, incredibly uh, amazing to see was how supportive your girlfriend's been through the whole thing uh -huh. That. Yeah, sorry, yeah, can you? Did you um uh, how supportive? Yeah, yeah, yeah I heard what you said. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I know she's been amazing, and especially when we were when it happened in Dubai, she didn't leave the hospital once. I think unless she was trying to get some clothes that she she been wearing for seven days. But uh, yeah, no, she she really is my my best friend, and she's always by my side every time someone sees me. She's always with me, <laughs> and uh, yeah. And, and that your, your family, well, your, your family I, I, are also I, super supportive as well, aren't they? Yeah, I'm just I'm very close to mom and dad too, and it's I know they found it really hard not being able to be there, and I found that really hard too. But we were uh, I Facetime them every day, or we have to, every day in my way. I were always Facetime, but when I was there, we were Facetiming them and stuff. And I think maybe if Megan wasn't there, they would have come out because I would have really struggled. But um. I, if I was alone, man, I, I really don't think I'd probably be here right now because it really, really, it was really hard. Especially even after the surgery, I couldn't feel my arms or legs and for about three days and I was being sick constantly and they had to give me so much, it's called anesthesia. Five times the amount of anesthesia they would for a normal human, right? And so that it made me really ill and I couldn't feel my limbs afterwards because uh, I'm some sciencey term, but it, I was in such a bad way after it because of the, not even at my direct my pet, the rest of my body just felt like it was dead. You know, I was like throwing up all over myself and I couldn't move. And I was so hot and the nurses there were like, oh, it's okay. I'm like, it's not like, okay, I'm going to die. <laughs> You so yeah, to... I'm just I'm so blessed to have a mom and dad and then Megan too and this close knit circle. You know, there's not many people that are in my life, but these the, the, these people that are are uh, joined at the hip. You know. Yeah, I think as a testimony to that, the fact that you're doing like you can see in the background all the family photos and stuff, and obviously on the video on here, uh, it says a lot. Yeah. So this is what the whole house is like. Yeah. 
<laughs> I don't know if that's you horse riding in the background, Ryan, but I probably presume not. Um, no, 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 it's not. It's, it's my brother's daughter. This is, these are all like the uh, my, my nieces and nephews. Yeah, my brother's and sister's kids, I think. But yeah, it's me and my mum, not the long time ago. But <laughs> in regards to your plans of getting, obviously, like back to top is obviously one is the big goal. And then obviously to prove other people that you can do it. What's your approach and thought process with that? And have you reached out to anyone else you've sort of like mentored you in the past, like uh, BPAC or Milos or anyone like that out of interest? Yeah. I, well, when I reach out to these people, they're one, they're like, you fucking idiot. And two, they're like, just be, just be slow, you know, and don't rush me. Which is true, right? Because especially with how much social media attention it's all got. And now, if I was to do the same thing again, you know what I mean? I just, I wouldn't even want to put my face on social media again. I just, I feel like, yeah, especially after, obviously, the whole GoFundMe thing. And I, I mean, I didn't do it. I didn't force anyone to do it because I've got a lot of negativity about it. But it was amazing too. And obviously, it wouldn't have happened without that. But there was a lot of negativity after that. And, after I tore it again, it was only a minor, but it, again, you're like, oh, you made the wrong pay, now you've been a fucking twat bench pressing again. I thought, I didn't do it bench pressing, mate. I've still got my arm in a fucking sling. You know, it's just, it's the way the population are, aren't they? They just want to be things. negative about everything. Yeah. I think- and that's what I think I find about the UK so much. Been back here, what, five weeks now? It's too long. I want to leave. Yeah, I think well, the only thing I like, it's just nice to be here with my dad. That's it. Um, yeah, that's the only thing I like. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be said about. I think there's more negativity, I think, in, in our culture than maybe some other places. Um, in terms of your training, you're at the moment, where you go, oh, no, you continue. Okay, there was, um, I don't know who said this to me, right? It's, it's a little bit of, it's a bit interesting, but it's so true. If you look at um, the R com- like my comments on social media or your comments on social media, I don't know about yours, but okay, let's just say general people's on social media comments, messages, everything. The, the the minority it is of being British people is so amazing, and I, I always wondered why. But this, this person said to me, it's because, for example. Indians, Asians, all these sort of people. One, they love muscle, but two, they're not scared to show that they, they fanboy. You know, they're not scared to show that, oh man, I think you're really amazing. You know, like they post that, oh, I love you, Ryan, thank you so much. And it's so true. It's like if you're it's a British person, they're like, oh, no, I can't say, like, oh, oh, he's really cool, but it's embarrassing. You know, everyone's going to think I'm gay. It's so true, right? Yeah, fact. right? Like all the people that are in different countries that we've traveled to, everyone's like, oh, wow, man, you look really good can you help me or you've really motivated me or everything. I'm like, yeah. But I also know that these people in the UK are thinking the same thing, but they just think it's gay or whatever it is for them to say it to you just in case someone calls them out. like, oh, mate, why, why are you brown nosing him? You know what I mean? That's literally it. Everyone's just too scared to, to look in a certain way. I believe that's true. Well, if you, if you look at like people in central London, for example, uh, everyone commutes, they see the same people every day, but no one speaks to each other. They sit in silence on like, the train. Yeah, well. right. How, how awkward is that? But if that, was, if that was in a different country, it would be so totally different. Yeah. That's what always, I've always find amazing in the US is like people just randomly come up to you be like, I like your hair, I like your shoes, or like whatever, just like making a nice, polite yeah. conversation. And it's nice. Yeah, yeah, of course. And it's, I, I think it's even, well, not even worse, but it's the same thing in like the bodybuilding fitness kind of world no one really wants to help anyone out you know before it was oh i don't want to train with you mate because you'll help my physique look better on stage and then you might beat me but even now it's like oh you want to train man like let's get some instagram stuff they're like no because you're like because they don't want you to gain their followers and sort of shit and i'm like oh man come on that's that's the way the world works mate i'll help you you help me out but apparently not but it's the same in a business perspective. I find the same thing with people in the UK have a very like scarcity mindset and they're not willing to help other people. Whereas people from like US and Canada will like jump on a call and tell you anything you want. And like, it's just very, very interesting. 
Yeah, very true. It's like there's enough money and enough things in this world for us all to be successful. Why? Why do you think that you telling him something's going to stop you from losing money, making money? You know, hundred percent. Now, one thing I think is interesting. Obviously, you alluded to it a minute ago. Obviously, the GoFundMe page was done after your injury to help with funding the surgery, um, uh, which was awesome. I think the surgery was what, like thirty thousand dollars or something. Uh, it was actually thirty-nine thousand pounds in the end. Um, plus, there was obviously more fees when we actually had to check out. But I think in total, just hospital fees, it was probably fifty thousand pounds, maybe a little bit more. But then obviously, after that, I had all the rehab fees and the extra visits to the surgeon and everything. It was just a complete nightmare, you know. But here's the 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 bomb drop. Can you imagine if that wasn't filmed and if there was that guy that I don't know who he was, the guy who was with Ar- uh, Larry, who's filming on the mobile phone, if he didn't have that video? And, uh, Sharif, yeah. Yeah, Sharif. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, that would be in a shit show then because obviously... Yeah, of course, right? So let's so try, and, try and look to the positives of it. If it was here in the UK, I would have gone on NHS and they would have told me that they couldn't fix it because I know a lot of people here that have done the same and they've said, can't do it just because they can't bother um or i could have gone somewhere else to get it done but then i again wouldn't have still had the money you know i don't have 20 30 40 50 thousand pound of my bank saved up just waiting to spend on an injury or even waiting to spend on anything i just kind of live paycheck to paycheck to be honest trying to save what i can but yeah if that wasn't if that hadn't happened then i wouldn't have had it fixed you know and, and again so grateful for that and Still in shock a lot that it went up so much. And people were willing to donate that. But I think that, again, shows that through my personality, you know, the, I'm so open, I'm so genuine to everyone. And I'm trying, I'm not going to try, I'm just, I feel like I'm a very likable person. And I think that was maybe one of the reasons why um, people, a lot of people did donate. You know, if I was a, Get a lot of negative comments like, "Oh, you're asshole and shit." Now I'm like, "Well, if I wasn't asshole, I don't think all these people would have helped me out." You know, there's a lot to be said for that, and I think it's one of those things. What's nice to see is that when um, someone's having a shit time, that like other people pull in to try and help out, because it's one of those things you never know when you need someone to help you. And I think that's one of those problems where people are so uh, arrogant and almost mean to other people. Sometimes it's like you never know when you might need someone's help. Exactly right. It'll be these people that are commenting on my stuff, and next they're going, "Oh, Ryan, can you share my GoFundMe, please?" Yeah, like legitimately, it would be something like that. Now, when it comes back to obviously, can I have a training program. Yeah, well, could you train me for free, please? Um, yeah. And to be fair, I've had that. I had that with someone trolling me the other day, and I was just like, they they trolled me, and then they wanted something for free, and it's like it's just ironic. But um, there you go. Yeah. The nature of the beast and with your plans of obviously getting back to um the top what what are you looking to do strategically from a training nutrition side of things or are you still sort of feeling that out at the moment just being very tight in terms of training execution and, and cautious in that respect yeah i mean you know me obviously i learned from that muscle doc jordan shallow all those sort of people so my exercise is execution in my head i know exactly what i'm doing and i know how to do everything and uh, i'd say 80 percent of the time i was always good good form you know good execution sometimes i thought I need to put the weight on you know get some fun because it you know, i do like chucking the weight around a little bit but uh yeah definitely now everything is kind of slapped down to being executed as well as i can with an injury you know like sometimes i'm training back if I protract too much, it kind of scares me. So, I'm trying to keep that back as much as possible. Um, and obviously, I do think that if I was training heavier, that maybe I would be, have more fullness to my muscles right now, and everything would look a little bit better. But again, it's that like way off. I'm just too scared, man. Um, I think it just takes time, and I really thought it'd be quicker than this. You know, like what was it March? Yeah, it was eight months now, but ten, seven months now. 
I really thought by now that I would be like training the pack pretty scared, not not as scared as I am. You know, like when I'm using it right now, I'm like staring at it the whole time and overcompensating because well, I haven't trained my other pack too since, right? Because I thought well, I don't want to keep training this pack really hard and that get really big and this be awful. So, but now when I'm trying to train this pack, I've just like got no feeling. Like for me to contract, it's really hard. And like obviously this one's like high, over sensitive, so like I can contract this, and it's like touching. It's like whoa, but this one's like just was dead. But uh, yeah, just be careful as I can, and try to get muscle black and get bigger again. You know, um, I don't really know what I'm going to do about the way the tendon looks. Um, but I know that Kevin Lebrone obviously had a really bad tear, similar. And uh, he managed to carry on afterwards. But you could never see his tendon. He just had like a bit of a, a hole in the pec. And it looked okay. But I definitely think mine right now, anyway, it looks worse. What What's your, your training look like when you're doing chest at the moment? Is it just a lot of isolation work? Oh, yeah. I mean, like, so yesterday, I just did a decline hammer strength. I did the incline hammer strength, the pec deck. The cable flies. Everything was kind of single armed because I want to really focus and controlling it. So I'm doing everything one arm at a time. Still very light, you know. Everything's under 25 kilos maximum. Um, it's weird because the other arm is still not like if I if I put 20 kilos on the hammer strength press. And do them both at the same time. This arm still struggles the same. It's really weird. But right now, this one's not that much stronger than the other. They move like, like it's like they injured both. Um, but obviously, it's just because I haven't trained it either, I guess. Um, I'm just kind of doing a bit of like more. Like, I'd say maybe a push because I'm trying to do a bit of shoulder and front delt the same day too. Because I'd say for a long time now, I just kind of go in the gym and do. A little bit on every body, on every muscle, you know, because again, I can't go in there and smash back and train chest really hard. So I can't just do upper body, lower body, upper body, lower body. Yeah. Because it's just really hard, you know. I still am struggling. You know? uh, it's, uh, I have to admit, you know, I try to put it off in my head. But I just don't think about it. Let's go through it. Then I'm like, oh, okay, I'm struggling. I think it's one of those things. It's just, uh, what's that saying? Like time heals all wounds. Like it's just going to take time and eventually it'll start to like go. Do you know what I mean? But yeah, said, of it's, course. it's only been eight, eight months. But, yeah, I mean, but it sounds like, so it feels like a long time. But it's just one of those things that's never going to go back to how it was. You know, I don't think I've ever had anything like that happen to me in my life before, you know. Well, no, I haven't. Where, like, something's, I don't know, if you get a cut or something, you can't use it, or you break your arm, you know. Break your arm, for example. I broke my hand, broke my arm, everything. It's all it's all back now. It's fine. And it looks, looks the same. You wouldn't even know. But obviously with this now, it's forever going to look the way it does. So when you, when you broke your arm, for example, do you lose a lot of muscle tissue then? Uh, on that arm, yeah, because obviously you put a cast on it and you don't see it at all. I took out a cast and I was like, it was like just a skinny rod. And I was like, wow, but I do remember after that training again for a few months was really hard, but it was fine, you know, it never really set me back long term. Um, I broke my hand too, so none of those things really, really ever messed me up. I think definitely the muscle. I think I would rather have broken a bone than tore the muscle for sure. I think obviously it wouldn't have been, in terms of bodybuilding, much bad damage. Yeah. Um, I think maybe if you break your, your leg, that would be quite bad. 100%. I think also the fact that you wouldn't be able to walk and you become super immobile, I then think it'd be difficult to then try and keep body weight off because right. you can't really move. Yeah, exactly. That's, I mean, it's a little bit different, but... Obviously, when I was in it, this, the cast sling with my pet, Megan was doing everything for me pretty much because one, 
I'm not left-handed, but two, I'm just also scared that like moving my body too much is irritating it, you know, because I just wanted to keep it as like this as much as possible. And like, even laying down and getting up off bed, I couldn't do it myself. I know it sounds stupid, but when you contract your abs, it's somehow it's connected to your pec up here. Every time I'd move my abs, oh, man, it really hurt. So like, I couldn't lay down or anything. I was like, my pillows were like 10 pillows up. I was just sat up sleeping like this. I imagine you were scared to like sneeze or cough as well. Yeah, anything like that. It's crazy. Because I think obviously when it happened, that was extremely painful. But I went home afterwards, didn't I? And laid down on the bed and then it cramped. And then I could see it literally pulling away across my body in front of my own eyes. And it's solid. And it's literally ripping off the bone even more. That was so painful. I was screaming, I'm punching the wall. Going men, mental, and Megan's got her elbow in it, trying to like help it release off. And I'm like, back in cold summer, and she's calling people. She's like, Oh, it brings me in. And I thought, All right, let's go down there. And then obviously, went down and we had to wait for the dog to shine because someone else would have cut it open and said, No, nah, can't do it, mate. You know, that's where I think you have to like look at that as a positive that you obviously got. Um, obviously what happened was shit but that you got I don't know if luck is the right word but you got fortune in the fact of the guy who, who yeah. fix it, fixed it do you know what I mean yeah I mean I don't know if anyone's anywhere else in the world that could have done a better job but I just dealt with the way I am right 100% 100% what would you say in terms of like I, I actually remember as well after the um, injury had happened that we went out for food maybe like, like 10 days maybe two weeks afterwards and i remember having to cut food up for yeah, you, yeah. like and I <laughs> how, how awkward i forgot about that yeah and like literally how terrified you were to like knock it on anything because you were walking around with this massive like yeah. cast with almost like you, you yeah, like with your yeah you yeah, were walking through them all and i was like yeah. this right hey, well, fucking gonna touch it. Well, <laughs> yeah um so you, you could see how like concerned and almost fragile you were with it but even now man if I'm carrying a bag with that arm or I slip, I'm still scared that if I slip and catch the arm, it's just going to bang off again, you know? That, like, jolty movement is the worst for it. Not even just putting it under load, like bench pressing. Like, if I was to get... If you were to run into me right now and push my arm back, I think it would just come off again. I think there's a lot... most scared about. It's almost like... Um, like, I've damaged all the ligaments in my ankle, and it's almost like a neurological, like, memory that your body just remembers as soon as you go into that position, like, holy shit, this is what happened before. Do you, does you feel a bit like that maybe? I tr obviously I've tried not to think about it yeah, actually too much, but uh, I don't really remember the day of it happening. Like I don't remember because obviously oh, as soon as you're after just banging down the painkillers and then they give you morphine and you know as well. You know, everything they give me in the hospital is on that bill. So I've got like 700 pieces of A4 paper with what they gave me. Because obviously they charge you for everything. So you've got like morphine, you've got syringe, you know, everything. Everything on there. Everything they've given you is on there. And like when you're there, you're like, yeah, give me more painkillers. And then you look back and you're like, shit, I was another 50 quid. <laughs> yeah, it racks up quickly. Well, you think, oh yeah, I imagine Dubai is expensive, but like the US as well, like medical bills there. Like, Wait, uh, did you have surgery? No, no, no. The um, oh. the um, yeah. medical bills in the US and stuff would be insane as well. All oh, right, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I think it's probably worse than in Dubai, though. Why do you think that is? <laughs> Just because everything is more expensive in Dubai. Yeah. Even though when I'm there, I'm like, oh, that's not too bad, man. You know, like, because obviously I was paying the same amount for the hotel apartment as I was as my apartment in America. And had a cheap car. Just, I think the daily thing you should spend money on is where it racks up, you know? Like, you go to a shop, get a Red Bull, it's like five pound of Red Bull. And then, like, obviously the gym day passes or wherever you're doing, I think it's the daily occurrence spending. But apart from, like, the outright payments of rent and car and whatever, I think it's the daily money. 100%. So are, you, are you going back soon? I know you're back and forth quite a lot. Uh, December, hopefully. So I'm going to Finland next month randomly. But um, oh, cool. Yeah. Right. Uh, going to see the Northern Lights and go like snowmobiling and stuff like that. So, 
Oh wow, that's yeah, awesome. You know you can sleep in those like uh ice igloo things where you can yeah, yeah. in that. So that be yeah, I would love to do that. Yeah, so that should be pretty Is that cool. really expensive or not too bad? Uh this sounds really random and anyone who's in Finland who can hook me up, let me know. The most expensive thing, the flights are really expensive. Like because we have to get like internal flights. It's, it sounds oh, really, really? no sense at all to fly to Helsinki and then to some it must be sorry that's to the weather warnings and stuff, you know, maybe it's not safe to fly to I don't know. Yeah, it looks like weird like that. I don't think there's a lot of flights there either as well, so I think that's what racks it up a bit. But um, yeah, so uh, Dubai is definitely summer. I like Dubai this time of year. Is, is nice, not so much in the summer. Like when we mate, when we trained legs uh, in August, mate, it was, was awful. It? That that was no, horrendous. September. Yeah, August maybe it was August. Yeah, I know. Well, obviously, we stayed there all year, didn't we? Until we came home, maybe four weeks ago, whatever it was. But uh, yeah, man, it was so hot. When people are like, oh, it's like fifty degrees. I'm like, yeah, okay, be right. It's not okay. <laughs> Like that, it's that, so um, so for anyone for context, basically, they built like a new leg area in Banu's gym, but they didn't put any air conditioning in there yet. So, yeah. we were training in there, like, l- legitimately, it was probably 45 degrees in there. I think you were sick at one point, it was like a literal sauna. Mm. Yeah, it was. Oh, yeah, it was. You went off and did your running about a sp- split, like, did you Bulgarian split squats or something like that. And I was throwing up. I was like, well, he was, oh, I'll just done these. Oh, right. Yeah, so um, to finish on a positive note, for anyone who's listening who obviously a big thing you did was obviously build a lot of muscle very quickly uh, in your youth, although you are still very young. What would you say are the three main things you would focus on for anyone who's looking to, to emulate that like progression? Consistency, man. Like, And I, I think too many people these days are too... The word I'm going to use is picky but i don't mean that i think too uh i don't know okay yeah, just to say it's too picky i think they're like too worried about what they're doing they're actually doing it they're like oh, i need a logbook i need to get my rice krispies post workout i need to do this i need to do that mate just go to the gym live as heavy as you can eat as much decent food as you can consistently and you will grow i think so many people over over complicating that and it really annoys me. Like, oh yeah, I've got my pre-workout black cocoa pops or my post-workout white cocoa pops. Yeah, I, know, I know you eat cocoa pops, but the point is, is I feel like people think about what well, they're doing too much, especially that when they're young as well. They're like, oh, I want to compete, and oh, I'm not big enough. And I think that's what I say to everyone. I said, look, if you want to compete, you're doing now, do it this year. You know, like start a diet now and get on stage. Because if you don't, you're going to get in that little cycle of oh, i'm not big enough not good enough i'll wait till next year then i'll wait till next year then next year five years down the line you've never been on stage you haven't established your name in the fitness industry at all and you're like oh, okay i'm gonna get on stage now and then everyone's like oh it's a 25 year old you know looks good but uh you know i think again in this world you need to you have an established name i know it's such shit but uh the more times you're on stage and the, the better you get in front of people that are watching it helps in terms of like trying to make money from the sport in terms of clients, coaching, sponsors. Two, obviously, then you learn how to diet. Three, when your body goes from dieting to bulking, you, without being scientific, it once you get to a lean point, next time you get lean, it's easier to get there and more. So every year I, I diet for a show. And next year I'll be leaner, pretty much. You know, as long as I do everything right. Just because your body has been there before, so it's oh, okay. I can do this. That's where when you take it to the next level, it's always harder, you know. Um, so yeah, that do do a show if you want to compete. Do it now. Don't wait till ten years time. Eat as much food as you can consistently. Train hard. Um, I'm, I've never logbooked anything in my life, man. I, I, you do, don't you? Do you logbook? Yeah, yeah, I do quite a lot. I think. I think it's just me being maybe a meathead or whatever, but I don't really think it's needed, especially especially when you're young. Maybe you do, but I don't think it would have benefited me, to be honest, because I was always very trained as hard as I can for as long as I can. I don't think that my sets that I owe, you know, I do like five, six, seven sets, where some people do like two sets. I don't think they're wasted sets because they're either like warm-ups just making me ready or they're sets where I worked really hard and I'm definitely accruing some muscle tissue growth you know um, but obviously everyone looks in terms of training in a different way 
I just I was never really a big fan of that kind of Dorian Yates kind of training style. Even when you um, were, when you were with Ben, were you were you logging and writing stuff down or not? No, not really. Not in terms of weights. I think again, I think you get too um, too glued on the numbers. And like, if next week you're not performing as well, then more, especially for me, like you know, like not being the most mentally stable. When if you're like, oh, I did 50 kilos last week, I did everything perfect all week, but I only did 40 kilos this week. You know, I think it's just a bit too much. You know, if you have a rough idea of where you're at, I think I think that's the best way to do it. Um, obviously, other people have different opinions, but I mean, I've gained. 75 kilos of muscle from when I started to last year on stage and that's like with glutes to with glutes so definitely 70 kilos of muscle that's double my body weight my first stage weight was 69 kilos that was 140 something last year so I gained a lot of muscle it's quite an incredible feat to be honest but obviously I really give myself the pat on the back that I would if it was someone else you know but if he's like I gained 70 kilos like, wow that's cool I'm like, yeah, it's all right, I guess. That's, um, that's one of the things I was going to ask, is you mentioned about competing as soon as possible, because like, I've seen the photos from your first show. And what was your body weight then? Yeah, 69 kilo. I, yeah. I wasn't the best, was I? Um, um, but, but, but that I shows that how high how you can go. This is it. Yeah, but that, that shows how far you can go. Um, one other interesting thing you talk about earlier, I mentioned about the butterfly effect. So you mentioned that obviously you got into bodybuilding because there was a gym next to the garage you worked in. So for example, imagine if that gym wasn't there, we wouldn't be having this conversation and you probably never got into it anyway. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, I, when I was at school, I started training at the school gym with two of my friends, but I was too scared to go. So I went with them. We all went, they left and went back. I haven't left since. But I did have to get a note from mom and dad to say that I could train because you're not allowed to use weights to you're 16. So I had this note saying, please let my son use the weights. And it happens, it's our fault. Um, so I started doing some weight training there. Lost some weight, got a bit skinny, but then I was like really embarrassed. I was like, oh, I'm gonna look, look really bad now. So then that was when I went to Nissan and I went next door to the bodybuilding gym. But yeah, if I hadn't gone in there and he had done what he did, I don't think I'd be here now, to be honest. Um, so I do owe a lot to him and I don't talk to him anymore, which is a shame because I am that sort of loyal person, but people will just go different ways, roads in their life, don't they? Yes, uh, people change. Um, one last question for you, Ryan. You mentioned it earlier. So are you going to try and do a show, do you think, next year if you get yourself back together? Yeah, of course. I love that. Yeah, well, it's, in my head, I have this. I want to step on stage and be like, which peck did he tear? As that was my original thought. But I think now it's going to be too hard. Like, the leaner I get now, I'm like, well, it's going to be too obvious, man. I think I'm just going to have to go up there knowing I've um, torn my peck. Uh, everyone knows it too. So I just think I have to do the best I can. You know, and especially if, if I still hold maybe 300 pounds of muscle on stage, shredded, um, I know, the, I know I'll get judged down for the injury, but uh, I might still be able to do okay. I hope so, yeah. I, I, uh, I have no doubt about that. I have no doubt about that. Um, so to wrap things up, Ryan, where's the best place to check you out on social media? Uh, Instagram, Ryan Crowley 97 is what I use most. I do have a TikTok, the same. I do have a uh, YouTube too, but uh, I'm not very good at editing and filming and you know, doing the long type of video. So I do stay away from that. I did do something in Dubai and I kind of wish I kept it up here, but um, I will get back to the YouTube kind of setup because I do feel like people then get to know you more personally. Yeah. So I do want to do more YouTube. But uh, yeah, just Instagram, man. Like everything's on Instagram. 100%. So thank you for everyone who's listened along to this. So uh, we have obviously, as I mentioned, we've got a prize that's going to be given for relaunching the podcast, which is going to be three months worth of free coaching worth £1,500. <laughs> Hundred pounds worth of tough, tough wrap vouchers, two hundred fifty pounds of Muscle Nation um, clothing supplements as a bundle. All you need to do to win this is leave a five star review on iTunes, subscribe and share a screenshot of this podcast to your social media stories, and tag myself and Ryan. And we will see you in the next episode of the Shredder Show. <laughs>